Orca Slicer version 5.3.0 introduces some powerful new features. So what better time to produce a guide for advanced users that can hopefully take your 3D printing to the next level. For me, Orca Slicer is still easily the standout slicer for preparing 3D prints. Recently, my patrons requested a power user guide to help them uncover any non-obvious tips and tricks. So watch carefully because there's hopefully something new for every person. Before we start, Orca Slicer is found on GitHub under the user Soft Fever and at orcaslicer.com. And as this note says, the websites for orcaslicer.net, orcaslicer.co and orca-slicer.com and not official websites, so beware. If you're curious about Orca Slicer and looking for a video to help you get started, well, this video is not for you. But that's okay, because I've linked my previous video on exactly that topic. If you've got questions like whether you need the Bamboo Network plugin, whether you need to log in or not, if you're wondering how to set up your printer, looking for help on how to get your printer wirelessly connected, the general settings and layout of the slicer, as well as how the built-in calibration test prints work, well, that video is for you. And like that video, this video will have some overlap with Prusa Slicer, Bamboo Studio, and even Super Slicer because they're all related and from the same family. We're gonna start with printing by object. By default, the print sequence is set to by layer, and this is what you're most likely used to, where everything prints one layer at a time with travel moves between the objects as necessary. The downside of this is that if you're printing a full plate of small objects, if one comes loose, it's probably going to make the rest fail too. So our other option for print sequence is by object. There's some minor setup required, and I've linked this wiki page from Bamboo Studio that explains the implementation, because that's exactly how it works in Orca Slicer. And this guide and diagram up the top is the main information that we need. Our first measurement is the horizontal clearance from the nozzle, so we need to move the bed down and out of the way. On this printer, I've got two part cooling ducts either side, and then the beacon ABL sensor that hangs out the back. So what we need to do is to look at these and anything else on the print head and work out what is sticking out furthest away from the nozzle. For me, the horizontal duct sticks out quite a bit, but the ABL probe actually sticks out further. But keep in mind when you're measuring, it's actually a diagonal that will give the longest distance and that's what we need. This measured distance is the extruder clearance max and I think it makes sense to round it up for safety. For the next two measurements, we need to bring the bed up. In fact, all the way up until the nozzle is touching it. For extruder clearance to rod, we're gonna measure from the bed to whatever the lowest point of the printer is that isn't part of the print head, most likely some sort of gantry. And then finally, extruder clearance to lid is meant to be from the bed to the underside of any lid. My printer doesn't have a lid, so I did to the top of the frame. We can now open our printer settings and input these three measured values. They'll be found underneath the section extruder clearance. There's also the printable height, but hopefully that's already set. You can now save and close your printer profile. So now in the other section, you can change print sequence from by layer to by object, and that will show some blue guides on the print preview area. Let's quickly add some random primitives to demonstrate how this works. And you can see as we try to move any of them, we have our extruder clearance visualized with a gray circle. And if that overlaps for any two objects, we'll get an error in the corner. Orca does recommend using auto arrange, but using these visual guides, you can still drag things exactly where you want them. If we drag the layer by layer preview, we can see they're printing in sequence. And to change the order of that sequence, we can switch to objects instead of global, and then drag the individual objects up and down with the objects being printed in order from top to bottom. Playing with the print preview bar should verify any changes you've made. Here's a quick time-lapse print to verify that this does in fact work. And it's nice to have another option when you've got multiple small objects to print and you're worried about one coming loose and ruining the rest. This is also a handy feature if you suffer from stringing on long travel moves. By printing the objects one at a time in sequence, those travel moves will be reduced and the print should end up cleaner. Now interestingly, you would think that all of this moving back and forth would produce a slower print than when we print sequentially and have them one at a time. But for this example, the print time was almost 40 minutes longer. And after some head scratching, I worked out that because the individual layers were shorter, slow down printing for better layer cooling was being invoked and dramatically lowering the feed rate for the individual objects. 
so just something to keep in mind if your current project needs to be done in a hurry. Following on, just a quick word on per object settings. In Oka Slicer, if we have multiple objects, we can vary the settings between them. To do that, we switch to the Objects tab, select one of the objects, and then the available settings are listed below under the six headings at the base. This is great if you want to experiment and compare two settings like infill strength back to back in the same print. When we're printing sequentially, exactly the same principle applies, and regardless of the object and the order, we can change individual settings for that item as we see fit. Now for sharing filaments in between your printers with the new filament library. This is a new feature that's been implemented from Orca Slicer 230, and although it's a little bit different than the preview here, it is entirely welcome and useful. Previously, myself and many other people found sharing custom filaments between printers quite confusing. We can see in the upper left, I have a custom profile for TPU sublimation. This is after going through and making changes and tuning for this specific purpose. So what happens if I want to change to the A1 Mini, which is mechanically pretty much the same. The filament profile is missing because it's tied to a specific printer and it doesn't matter what you tick for the system filaments, you won't be able to carry it over and it's missing from the custom filaments too. In the past, I would have manually copied it over all of the filament settings, but now with this rework and the global library, you no longer have to. Let's share a X3D PETG profile that I've built up for the P1P. Next to the profile we want to manage, we need to click the edit icon to open up the profile settings and then come down to dependencies. There's multiple options here and the simplest one is to simply to click all and then save and close our profile. After doing this, we can click to any 3D printer at all that we've added in Orca Slicer and when we come to the available filaments, that filament will be available. That's brute force, but we can have more finesse and the next option is to click set next to compatible machine. This one is pretty self-explanatory. We can go through and tick every printer that we want to make this filament profile available for. The only trouble is the list is very long because it includes every single printer we can add, not just the printers that we already have. The final option, and one that's not really documented at the moment, is compatible machine condition. And here we put a Boolean expression, like a printer variable, to match certain traits so the filament profile will intelligently come up when needed. So what do we type here if at this stage it's not documented? To see the available options, we can edit the profile for any 3D printer. For any setting that we'd like to match with our expression, we can hover over that input box and see what the variable name is. One variable that I think might be useful is nozzle diameter. And if we hover over this, we can see that it tells us that it's nozzle underscore diameter with the index zero in square brackets. Let's close this box and then switch back to our filament profile. We can now type in this variable exactly as we saw it. Nozzle underscore diameter, open square bracket, zero, close square bracket. And if you're like me, you'll need to correct any typos. From here, we have a bunch of operators that if you've done any scripting, you'll be familiar with. Let's cover them with some different examples. Let's say is equal to by adding two equal signs and then typing 0.4. In summary, we're saying to share this filament profile with any printers that have a nozzle diameter of 0.4. Let's change to a printer that also has a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. Now, when we look at the available filaments, we can see that our preset is waiting for us. So now let's change to another printer that doesn't have that size nozzle. And as you would hope, our filament is no longer available from the list. Let's make a change to our compatible machine condition and make it not equals to. For this to kick in, we need to reload the printer from the top left hand side. And let's go back to our CR10 Max with a 0.6 nozzle. 0.6 does not equal 0.4, so the filament will show up. Selecting a random 0.4 millimeter nozzle printer means the filament profile won't show up. Let's do another variation where we change the operator to greater than or equal to. And this should match everything from 0.4 millimeters up. Selecting a printer with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle will show the profile as expected, as will selecting a printer with a larger nozzle like 0.6. But if I select a printer with a smaller nozzle like 0.2, as we would expect, the profile is not there. Let's look at another example by creating a filament profile to suit glow in the dark filament, which of course will need a hardened nozzle to not degrade the tip. If we scroll down in our printer profile, we can see that we have a variable for nozzle type with the name nozzle underscore type. The trouble here is that we don't know how to refer to the options like hardened and stainless steel because they have a gap in the middle. But digging around in the JSON for the existing printers, we can see that the nozzle type has an underscore in the middle 
So stainless underscore steel or hardened underscore steel. So with that in mind, let's write a new condition. We're going to enter nozzle underscore type followed by equals equals open quotes hardened underscore steel close quotes. Let's save the profile and see if this worked. If I now select a printer that has a brass nozzle set in its print profile, when I come to the filament list, we can see that glow in the dark is not there. If I now select my P1P that does have a hardened nozzle, the glow in the dark profile is sitting there waiting for me. Please remember that you can use OR and AND to add more than one condition. For instance here, I say that I want the nozzle type to be hardened steel and the nozzle size to be greater than or equal to 0.4mm. And that means the filament profile will only show up for printers who can match both of those conditions. You might have noticed that we can also have conditions for compatible processes, which are those listed on the left hand side underneath the filament profiles. In this section, for any slicer setting, we can once again hover over the input box to learn that variable name. For instance here, layer underscore height, or this one, wall underscore loops. This works exactly the same as our earlier examples. For instance, I set the wall loops to greater than two. With that saved, let's select a factory bamboo lab profile that has two wall loops by default, and we can see up in our filament selection that the glow in the dark profile is missing. But now if we select my custom profile that has three wall loops as the default, we can come to our filament selection and glow in the dark is present. One last tidbit that could save you if you make an error like the typo scene here. Now obviously, we're never going to get a match for this expression. So after we save the profile and change the printer, it doesn't matter what we select, we'll never be able to see that filament profile again to be able to fix our mistake. So we need to come up to the top menu and go to help, followed by show configuration folder. This will open up the Orca Slicer folder on your computer. We now open up the user folder followed by the folder with a number, it's gonna be different for you. Then the filament folder, and you should see all of the JSONs listed for your custom filaments. And we need to open the one with the mistake inside a text editor like Notepad++. From here, you can simply delete the mistake that you've made and then save the file. You will need to restart Orca Slicer for this to take effect. And when you do, your filament profile will be restored and you'll have access once more. My patrons specifically requested I cover project or 3MF files. And that's the first thing to understand here. 3MF files are compatible with other slices, but here they're called projects. Another thing to understand about 3MF files is they're actually zip files. If you change the file extension from 3MF to zip, you should now be able to open up the file and see what's inside. For instance, we have 3D objects like an STL, and we have data like all of the slicer settings, as well as images for previews. The final and most important thing to understand about 3MF files is that they're a complete snapshot of whatever you've set up in Orca Slicer. They save absolutely everything. They will save which printer that you had selected, as well as all of the print settings, which bed you had, which filaments were loaded up, including how many. They will save the entire print profile, including any modifications. They will include any 3D models, including their position, orientation, rotation, and scaling, and what filaments are allocated to what. For instance, here in this test model, the filaments that I had loaded into that EMS have been saved, as well as changes to the support settings to set up the interface as PLA. And when we slice, we can see that that's in place. In essence, everything has been preserved from when I hit save and created the 3MF. If you've added multiple plates with different files, all of those will be saved in their position, as well as with their filament allocations. Other things that are saved include filament painting, and previously I painted by hand the red on top of a white part. All of that is saved and preserved in the 3MF. The same applies if you had painted on a seam in a custom position or painted on where you wanted custom support or support blockers. 3MFs or project files, again, are a complete snapshot of everything you had going in the slicer at the point that you saved it. This is super handy, but it can also lead to issues. For instance, if we're downloading a 3MF from a file sharing site like Printables or Maker World. In this particular example, the 3MF I'm opening was saved in Bamboo Studio, and there's some settings present that aren't in this version of Orca Slicer. So we get a warning as we open it, as well as confirmation that machine and filament profiles are being imported that we didn't already have in our library. You might receive other unexpected errors that need to be addressed before you can print. In these cases, it's probably best to quickly switch the profile to a printer that you actually own and then check for any mismatches in slicer settings. Fortunately, in this case, there's none. 
we can see here I still need to do a little bit of repositioning and if I want the colors from the color painting to show correctly, I need to reset them on the left hand side. The lesson here is to check and double check before you print a downloaded 3MF to avoid any chance of damaging your printer. Let's finish with some smart ways to share and compare Orca Slicer profiles. Because the 3MF captures absolutely everything, they're also the ideal way to share print profiles as well as filament profiles. After I open up this 3MF, I can come to the Edit Presets button and then save this printer that I don't have, tidying up the file name and switching it to a user preset so we can access this printer outside of the project. And now from my printer dropdown, this printer will be available in future for me to use without me requiring any real setup. The same goes for any imported filaments. You can simply click the edit preset button and then save it to store it on your system. And of course, the same goes for any imported profiles. This can be a great way to share your profiles with others. And if you want to be more cautious and check a profile before you save it to your presets, you can come over to the button that has an A and a B labeled compare presets. The three fields here for printer, filament and process with a left and right hand side for comparison. Once you've populated the selection fields at the top, Orca Slicer will present any differences between the left and right hand sides. This will make finding changes someone has done from tuning much easier, allowing you to either retain values or reject those that are specific to other people's setups. And that's what I've got for this guide video. Make sure to head down to the comments section and let me know if there's any other features worth covering in their own video. Thank you to my patrons for requesting this video. Thank you to you for watching and until next time, happy advanced 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.